Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about the share market uh, because last week it closed at almost all time highs in both Australia and the US. And so it begs the question, where will returns go from here uh, and where are the risks in the market? So there's a strong historic trend that if your starting valuation is high, either in the company or market that you're investing in, that your subsequent 10 year returns are likely to be low. So there's a negative correlation between valuations and subsequent returns. And that makes sense, right? Because if you invest in a, uh, in a market that is fully priced, then there isn't a lot of upside. Or in fact, if you overpay to invest in a company, for example, its valuation is very high, perhaps then that uh, valuation is corrected back to sort of more normalized levels and that you potentially could experience some capital depreciation. And so when you look at the longest uh, published data, which in the US dates back into the 1800s, uh, in Australia back to 1970, and you look at you know starting valuation and subsequent 10 years ten year returns, there is in all those developed economy markets a very strong trend of negative correlation. So um, it begs the question, where, what are valuations looking like at the moment in equity markets? You know, if you're about to invest in the share market, for example, you're potentially about to invest in the peak of the market. I don't know. Uh, this is what I'd like to talk about. And if you if you are doing that, then you're probably not going to feel so comfortable. Uh, so there is uh, something called the CAPE ratio, and it's widely accepted uh, to be a good indication of where valuations are relative to history. CAPE is an acronym, stands for Cyclically Adjusted PE Ratio. Essentially what it aims to do is it it smooths 10 years worth of earnings out and then um, uh, calculates the PE uh, multiple based on those 10 years worth of earnings rather than the most recent earnings. Uh, So there's two things that will drive a market. That is earnings growth, so companies are making more money, of course, then they're more valuable, or multiples, which is the valuation of those companies. And what the CAPE ratio tries to do is extract the impact of earnings on valuations. Uh, There's the CAPE ratio in the US market is over 30 at the moment. Um, The long term average is really somewhere between 18 and 22, depending on the time period you look at and the adjustments you might make. Uh, so it's certainly suggesting that it's, uh, you know, above the long term average. And in fact, it's only been above 32 times in history in 1929. And we had uh, the market lost about 25% of its value on what's called Black Tuesday in 1929, the share market crash. And it was over 30 in December 2000, uh, it actually re- reached 44 uh, the CAPE ratio did, um, and anyone remembers uh, what happened between 2000 and 2002? It was the the dot com bubble or the tech wreck, depending on how you, how you want to uh, name it. And the Nasdaq 100 lost uh, really 78 uh, percent of its value between year 2000 and 2002. Uh, so I'm not saying that the CAPE ratio is indicating that there's going to be a crash. In fact, the CAPE ratio is very poor way of trying to measure what markets will do in the short term, uh, but it is a good measure of what markets will do in the long term. So it's saying that really valuations are high and all the long term data then suggests that returns will be low. Uh, By comparison, Australia's CAPE ratio is 18. So again, uh, US over 30, Australia 18.4. Uh, its median in Australia is 16.5, but fair value is really considered to be about 17.1. So slightly over, but not to the same uh, level as the US. Um, and if you think about it globally and even domestically, we've got a couple of headwinds. Uh, potentially, US is coming towards the end of an economic cycle. You know, employment is still growing. In fact, they had another record Uh, employment numbers released last week. Uh, Unemployment rate is at absolute historic record lows. Um, And we are starting to see a bit of an uptick in wage inflation uh, in the US as well. But it can't go on forever. 
and the S&P 500 index in the US has appreciated by more than 15% on average over the last, each year on average over the last 10 years. That's uh, 10 years of consecutive 15% or above returns. It can't go on forever. And the only question is, will it be a hard or soft landing? And so a hard landing is typically a recession. A soft landing is a gradual uh, slowdown. I note that the Fed has did come out in recent weeks saying, look, if we if we see the market struggling, we're prepared to cut rates, uh, and the market the market like that. Um, in uh, domestically in Australia, the RBA has expressed some concern with respect to the Australian economy, and has obviously cut rates in the last two uh, last two meetings down to one percent. Uh, their concerns mainly around low wage growth and subdued com- consumer spending. And the subdued consumer spending might be um, impacted because of the property market, impacts confidence, and therefore people uh, tend to reduce discretionary spending. Uh, and there is some noise and commentary that, you know, will Australians si- slip into recession? I-, I don't think so, but. Uh, certainly, you can't say the economy is booming. And then if you have a look in Europe, you've got Brexit still going on and persisting in the UK. And inside Europe, the German economy is slowing and Italy continues to be a bit of a basket case, although it's a pr- very small economy um, in comparison to, say, Germany, France and, and UK. Uh, so there are some headwinds, again, for us to consider when we are investing in the share market. Uh, also, you've got to think about, okay, 10 years uh, worth of 15% plus returns in the US, where have they come from? Uh, well, when you look at the aggregate value of the uh, top six tech companies, so that is Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, uh, the aggregate valuations, market valuations of those companies is uh, circa 3.4 trillion US dollars. Um, that's more than than the entire stock market value in China, in the UK. In fact, there's only two countries that have a stock market that's worth more than that, and that's Japan. Uh, it's uh, worth just over five trillion dollars, uh, and uh, the US market obviously is uh, worth over twenty one trillion dollars. But essentially, you've got these large Uh, tech companies that have really enjoyed a lot of growth and a lot of value and have driven a lot of the market. Um, But we all probably need to be a little bit concerned that we've got this concentration risk on uh, just these these companies. And they're under pressure in the US. Uh, They're sort of antitrust, which is uh, anti-competition laws, potentially wanting to break them up into smaller companies and so forth. And then when you look at some of the PE ratios uh, of some of those tech companies, like Netflix is 139 times earnings, uh, Amazon's 82 times earnings. You know, if you're investing in a company that's, uh, and you've got to pay uh, nearly 140 times earnings, I don't really understand kind of where the upside is. And in fact, tech valuations are a little bit puzzling. You look at Uber that listed recently, it's worth almost the same, almost identical uh, to what BHP is. The only difference is Uber doesn't make any money. Uh, BHP makes about $10 billion Aussie a year. So uh, really, this is a a bit of a problem, I guess, in terms of or or risk in the market is these valuations and they they have driven a lot of the return. Um, when you look at sort of long-term indicators and look at what the CAPE ratio is telling us, uh, there's a strong correlation in terms of it predicting what the next 10 years worth of returns will be, somewhere between 75 and 80% correlation rate. So it's not a perfect indicator, but it's a pretty strong indicator. Um, and when you look at that, it's, it gives us an indication of uh, what returns might look like over the next 10 years. Uh, in the US, there, it's indicating about 2.5%, 2.5% over a 10-year period, so certainly well below the 15% that we've become useful, used to, I should say. Japan, 3.7%, so again, well below trend. Uh, UK looks to be the, the best market in terms of price, probably because the uncertainty around Brexit, 9% for the UK, uh, 5.9% for Europe, and Australia, not so bad, 7.1%. Um, so, you know, again, these are pretty strong indicators of return. So really, US and Japan to underperform uh, Europe, including the UK, 
to probably perform much better than it has recently and Australia to perform uh, pretty well as well. So what does this all mean and how can we use this data and these indications to protect our investments? Well, um, Ben Graham was really regarded as the father of value investing and certainly and, and, and taught Warren Buffett at university and, and Buffett practices much of what he learned from uh, Ben Graham and has done and still does do today. The core tenant of value investing really involves uh, assessing the intrinsic value of a company or market uh, and only investing when you believe you can buy that market or that company relatively cheaply compared to your assessment of its intrinsic value. Uh, so it's really about looking at the fundamentals of a company and working out, am I paying a fair price? If you look at Netflix, for example, at a 139 uh, times PE ratio, uh, I think any value investor is going to look at that and go, I would have to be crazy to invest in a company like that. Um, but the problem with value investing is it's not very popular at the moment because certainly the last six years, value investing has underperformed growth investing. Growth investing is just really investing in stocks that are growing, that are providing most of the returns, like the tech companies and so forth. Um, and uh, last six years, value companies have underperformed. The main reason for that is probably a good example around Uber and Netflix and uh, these sorts of companies have been, and in Australia, you know, you look at Afterpay and Zero. these sorts of companies are driving a lot of the returns in the market, very popular at the moment, uh, but there's a complete absence of fundamentals. And there has been a complete absence of fundamentals for a, a reasonably long period of time. And therefore, it doesn't really matter about the fundamentals. People have invested, well, value investors have invested in companies that uh, or markets that have been fundamentally sound but haven't really been rewarded yet uh, for, for that. A, a good example is uh, Roger Montgomery's fund. And I think Roger Montgomery, he's a, well, he's an active funds manager and I'm a non-believer in active funds management, as, as you most of people listening to this podcast will know. But uh, if I ever change religions and become a, you know, a believer in active funds management, I think Roger would be uh, very close, if not at the top of my list in Australia in terms of fund managers. And if you have a look at his funds, uh, the Montgomery Fund, for example, uh, it's underperformed uh, over the last five years too. So it's a really good indicator um, uh, that you know, value investing just hasn't worked, uh, and it's not popular at the moment. But that doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't uh, give us or, or, or present any value at this point in the cycle. Uh, if you have a look at value investing versus growth investing, uh, dating back to uh, 1936 in the US, uh, almost always, uh, except really for the last six years, uh, it's outperformed growth investing. So at the end of the day, as Warren Buffett says, the market is a popularity contest in the short term uh, and uh, a weighing machine in the long term. So that is, the, you know, the weighing machine will all come back to fundamentals in the long term, uh, except for it's just been an extended popularity contest uh, uh, more, more recently. And it kind of reminds me of the early 2000s during that, that dot-com bubble um, where there was a pretty severe absence of fundamentals, but it only persisted for uh, about sort of two years or so. Well, this has gone on a, a little bit longer. In any case, I think the best way to really protect your portfolio is to um, uh, start adopting more of a value uh, investing approach. And so um, growth investing probably is more akin to traditional market cap indexing, uh, whereas there's alternative index strategies. There's still 100% passive, low-cost, rules-based approaches uh, that use evidence-based investing, but they break the link with price. So price is no longer our measure for how we diversify our investment. Let's use other mechanisms like fundamental investing, which looks at things like sales and cash flow dividends and net assets or dimensional that will skew towards um, uh, companies that are value closer to their book value or more profitable than their peers or smaller companies. Different mechanisms to reweight uh, really what would be an index towards away from the companies that exhibit the higher risk, the higher valuation risk, uh, and expose the portfolio to 
companies that look cheap or at least below their intrinsic value. Now, um, this probably isn't a popular strategy at the moment because why would I switch to a value-based strategy when it's underperformed the last six years? Uh, certainly, it's an easier sell if I say, let's switch to a strategy that's just shot the lights out. Um, but doing what's popular almost always isn't the right thing to do when you're investing. In fact, uh, counter-secular or counter-popular investing is, tends to be the, the best way, not follow the masses, that is. And certainly there's a lot of evidence that shows, uh, certainly from a, um, a study that I've highlighted in the show notes in the blog, uh, that uh, most investors uh, miss out on lots of the returns because uh, they're a little bit late to the party. So what will happen, I would imagine, in this market, which won't be any different to history, is that at some point the market will correct valuations and will go back to fundamentals. At that point, people will think, whoops, I better get out and switch to a value investing approach. Uh, but that'll be too late. They would have missed quite a lot of the risk, uh, you know, exposed their portfolio to quite a lot of the risk and, and miss a lot of the returns. Anyway, the research uh, that people have done around this around dollar weighted returns, which really looks at when did the money flow into the fund and when did the performance actually occur. Most of the money flows into the fund after the performance has occurred. You know, a fund will have a really good some really good returns and then everyone will decide to put all their money in. Uh, and uh, the, the dollar weighted uh, return versus the buy and hold return is about a 2% differential. So it shows that most investors are too late to make the change um, and uh, just don't have the discipline, I think, to, to stick to what all the indicators are telling us. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, essentially what I'm uh, suggesting is that perhaps exposing your portfolio to more value-based approaches, whether that be inside superannuation, uh, or outside, um, whilst might underperform, could possibly underperform for the next one or two years, particularly if the US market keeps going and the tech companies keep going higher and higher and higher. Um, so they might underperform for the next couple of years, but in the long run, the huge body of evidence uh, suggests that this can't go on forever. And if we switch to a value approach in the long run over a sort of 10 year period, for example, we will be well rewarded for that approach. So really it's a case of uh, ignore what's popular or trendy at the moment, uh, what's really working at the moment and stick to the fundamentals and you could be well rewarded for that decision. It takes a bit of discipline, um, uh, but uh, that's really a core ingredient for any successful investor. That's it for this week. Uh, until next week, bye for now.